Hi friends, welcome. Today I want to talk about approach anxiety. This is something that happens to performers when they're about to go on stage. This is something that happens to people who are about to meet new people. This is something that happens to me when I'm going to make one of these videos. I want to cast a broad net because this is something that applies to every craft and every discipline. Different situations, same feeling. I have spent my life intentionally putting myself in these sorts of situations because I enjoy the dance. Uh, for example, my, most of my youth was spent on, uh, spent on stage playing drums in front of people to the point that it's very comfortable for me to be on stage in front of people, more comfortable than it is to talk to my local barista. Uh, that's because I've done it so much. I also love to walk up to strangers and ask if I can take their photo for, uh, for projects. You may know this if you've watched this channel for long. So I've learned some things. One of the things that I've learned is that approach anxiety is, is something that involves your state of mind. And states of mind are very important. That if you go into a situation or a performance, quote unquote, whatever that means for you, in a frustrated or anxious state of mind, your end result could be very uh, unsatisfactory. Whereas if you go into something with a pleasant or confident state of mind, you may perform better than you expected. You may do something that you think you couldn't pull off. So state, states of mind are very important. Levels of focus are very important. The interesting thing about approach anxiety is it produces an elevated state of mind that I think is actually very useful for helping you accomplish your goals in performing. If we look at, if we look at our mind sort of like a river, in nature, you have, if you have a river with broad banks and water's flowing down it quickly, if you bring the banks of that river in, it flows quicker. The water flows quicker through a smaller river, and it becomes more turbulent, more intense. And if you jump into that river, you're probably going to die. So what we want to do is we want to make our performance die, <laughs> but in a good way. <laughs> I guess that analogy fell apart. Anyway. The, if you channel your, if you, th this elevated state of mind is a way to channel your energy into an immense focus, a powerful force of accomplishing your goals. So it's not a bad thing that you feel this anxiety and this nervousness. It's a useful thing. It's normal. Being scared is normal. It's a signal from your mind that you're about to do something risky and something potentially meaningful. And if you remember that this is, a, this is a signal, that you are approaching meaning, potential meaning, you can start to see it as a, a flag that goes up. Oh, this is a good thing. I need to lean into that. Seth Godin talks about this. He, he calls it the lizard brain or the resistance. And I apologize for using Seth Godin as a reference once again, as I used him in my previous video, but he's just good at saying smart things. This is a chicken. A chicken has a lizard's brain. Chickens and dinosaurs, they're all related. The lizard brain is the brain that you see if you look at a sonogram of a fetus, right? A little early fetus has a tail and has a little tiny thing on the top of its brain stem that as you watch the fetus develop through sonograms, you can see the path of evolution. It shows you, day by day, how human beings evolved. And it turns out that all lizards and chickens have is a lizard brain, an amygdala, as, as, as they say. And the idea of the lizard brain is this. It is hungry, it is scared, it is selfish, and it is horny. That's its job, and that's all it does. The reason they call wild animals wild is because they have lizard brains. And all they care about in any given moment, when you see a squirrel in Central Park, or when you see something scampering across the street, is how am I going to survive? How am I going to have kids? Get me out of here. <laughs> it turns out that we have one too. And if you look in the Wikipedia, there it is. There's a little picture of it, and there's the other brain on top. And that as evolution came along, that little one went there, and then we grew this new one on top, the limbic system and the neocortex. That's what dogs had first, and then apes and people like us. That part is all about how do I share? How do I be loyal? How do I connect? 
And then the part on top of that is, how do I come up with a really cool way to do something? How do I break tradition? How do I challenge the status quo? And we love living up here. But every single time we get close to shipping, every single time the manuscript is ready to send to the publisher, the lizard brain speaks up. The lizard brain, by the way, was in charge of you in high school. <laughs> and the lizard brain says, they're going to laugh at me. The lizard brain says, I'm going to get in trouble. What? TV is coming to watch me put graffiti on street signs? I'm going to get arrested. The lizard brain is screaming at the top of its lungs. OK, now I want to talk about ways to channel the river. Planning is incredibly important. This is something that actually affects your performance. It affects your confidence and your competence. It allows you to rely more on your subconscious than your conscious when the time comes to perform. It allows you to rely on muscle memory more. This is why actors rehearse, to make it really hard for them to fail when the time comes. Develop habits to keep yourself in a practiced state, whether a performance is on the horizon or not. And it's also a good idea to use daily situations to keep yourself in a constant state of mm, discomfort and alertness. An example of this is you're at the grocery store, you're going down aisle three, you're going to get your favorite canned tomato, cheese, soup, ice cream, and you see a woman walking past you. She has a beautiful necklace shaped like a walrus made of gold and mahogany. And normally, your antisocial self, you like your groove, your comfort groove. You would walk by her, you guys wouldn't interact. Today you're going to say, hey, I like your necklace, where'd you get that from? How's your grandkids? She's going to say, I don't have grandkids, I don't know why. You thought I had grandkids, I don't know who you are. You got yourself out of your comfort zone, and by doing this over and over, you make it where the hill that you have to climb when the time for performance comes is smaller than what it would be if you did not do this. Another thing is uh, don't dwell on the things that you've failed on in the past or the things that you're worried about in the future. Think about it, extract the knowledge from it, but don't, don't dwell on it needlessly. You can use this energy elsewhere. And a huge one is to be courageous, to develop courage. Going into a performance is going into a dance between chaos and order. You should embrace the fact that there's going to be chaos, that there's going to be feelings that are confusing and intense. Everything's going to be happening. Stuff's going to be metaphorically flying around and hitting you in the face. And it's a good idea to develop the ability to embrace those feelings. And I just like shoved my hand into my trachea. <laughs> Allow for the possibility of failure because failure may come. Be okay with that. With all of those understandings, you say, I am going to go forth courageously into this battle. And I think an excellent example of this battle is a story that my jazz pianist friend Austin Ross told me in a conversation a while back about a faculty concert that went a little bit sideways involving a guest artist named Ron. We got through those two tunes, and then Ron, our guest artist, walks out. And we start playing some of his tunes. And the first tune of his was really cool. It was a blues with a with a with a bridge with a B section. And then he and so that one we, he he had sent us beforehand, and he sent us like a, a list of songs that he might call at any given point in the concert that we might that we might play. And so one of the ones that he didn't send us was the one he ended up calling. And he's like, I'm going to slow it down for y'all. We're going to open up the dance floor. And it's a theater, so there's no floor to, on which to dance. And so All there's right. people laughing in the audience. He's I like, like this guy, though. Yeah, I do. I, he's awesome. He's like, you know who you are. Uh, anyway, but he, he didn't call a swing tune. He called a ballad really slow called My Foolish Heart. And he said, everyone pull out your real books. And the real book is uh, a big book of songs that everyone should know that's a jazz musician. And no one memorizes the real book, but it's kind of like a, a, a jazz musician's toolbox. The real book. I like The real that. book. Because there are fake books, right, that help you fake a performance. And so there was a bunch of them made that were really low quality. And someone was like, I was gonna, I'm going to make one that's the real one, the real book. Stupid. Anyway, <laughs> he's like, everyone get out your real books. 
and he was kind of talking to the audience, but he was talking to the audience, talking to the band, like being funny. And so I take that super seriously. I'm like, oh no, he's about to call a tune. I don't know. So I, <laughs> I, I pull out my real book. I was like flipping through the pages and it's on my iPad. I'm using the real book on my iPad. All the, all the, the musicians on stage are panicking. <laughs> no, these guys are, are pros. They're all faculty. So they, they mm-hmm. will take anything you can throw at them. Legit. They can, they can play anything, anything you tell them. Me, I'm an amateur. So he takes, he, he, he's like counting us off. And I still don't know. He's like, one, two, one, two, three. And I don't know what the song is. And at the very last second, he's got his bass trombone in his hand. He leans over to me. He says, young man, my foolish heart in B flat. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Sorry, like <laughs> limping through the pages as fast as I can. I pull up my keyword search. I type it in. I'm like, ner- my hands are shaking. I'm like, oh, my God, what is happening? So, well, that, like, Can I stop you really quick? Yes. What was, what was the value of that pressure in that moment for you? Well, I'm getting to that. Okay, okay, okay. Carry yes. On. So well, he's already started the tune, right? And so I, I pull up I, my foolish heart, and the, it pulls up the index, right? And there's two, there's two songs called My and that start with F. Mm. And so I tap on my foolish heart, and it takes me to, it takes me to this chart. And I'm like, okay, great. I know where we are. And I start playing chords, and they don't sound right. And I'm like, this does not sound anything like what he's playing. So I kind of lay off for a bit, and I just wait. And I'm looking at the top of the tune, and I'm like, okay, so there's an internal repeat here. So he's going to come back to this section at some point. And when he how does, I jump back in. How long did this, this uh, situation go on for before you sort of think It felt like out. an eternity. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, but it, in reality, this was about 10 seconds of yeah. real time. That's but that's me. That's live music for you. Yeah, and I'm sitting there, and it's like, okay, w- there was a repeat, and I'm jumping back in, and it still feels wrong. And I'm like, these chords are not right. They wrote this in the wrong key. And so I'm like, okay, how do I transpose? I'm tra- I'm doing all kinds of problem solving in my head. I'm like, how do I transpose the key? How do I change the key to, to be the right key? Am I playing the right notes? Some of these notes sound right. Some of these chords sound right. Some of them don't. And so I'm like really struggling with this with this is this when you were supposed to use the force right so yeah use the force take off take off your navigating computer luke you turn off your computer um, <laughs> it's or or you can access pain because this was blues right mm-hmm. okay you could have accessed previous pain in your life and you would have found the right chords yeah, absolutely. Through your, no, it's yeah, definitely, through your that's turmoil. definitely how music works. It's, I just play what I hear. It's just yeah. play what, what sounds good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah! So, Why did you leave me, Dad? It, I, it, just, it works. I am panicking right now. I, I'm sweaty under my armpits. My face is bright red. I guarantee you it's bright red. I, uh, and I'm sitting there in a huff. And he gets through the form. He's, he's a singer, too, if you didn't know. And he's a phenomenal singer. And so he gets through the forum, he gets, he finishes singing and he pulls up his bass trombone and he takes his solo on his bass trombone. I'm like, great. Okay. He starts, he's starting a new section again. I can jump in again. Nothing is working. I'm like, I eventually just sit out. I'm like, dear Lord Jesus, <laughs> <I give up. laughs> so send me a sign that I, I, I'm, that I'm doing something right, you know, like, <laughs> oh say, like, give me the court. Just tell my fingers what the Jesus take the wheel, right? Is basically what's happening. And uh. I lay out. I know Pete, my guitarist, he's got the chords, so I'm not worried that they're not that the song is going to go off the rails. I'm just worried that I'm drawing attention to myself and embarrassing myself in mm. front of this on in front of this audience of people who are trying to enjoy this world-class New York jazz musician sing, do his thing, right? I feel like they're saying, get that, who the hell invited this guy to play piano? Like, get that white boy get, off the stage. Get him off the stage, <laughs> right? So eventually, 
I look up again. I'm like, I'm just like closing my eyes. I'm like, please be over. Please, the song just end. And I look up and I realize the chart I was looking at was not my foolish heart in B flat at all. Okay. The chart I was looking at was my funny Valentine in C minor. Ah. So, yeah, those, those, I bet that didn't work together. So when I clicked on my foolish heart, I, my, fat finger was inaccurate and it took me to one page over so i flipped back to the other page to see this is why we need physical dials and buttons and music right this is this is the downfall of the digital screen and if you i want you guys to take anything away from this uh this this conversation tonight as whatever art form you take on you need physical dials and you need to fight for it and you need to uh, petition congress to make sure physical dials <laughs> stay uh, as, as a facet of your yeah, art because when the government tries to make something happen, it, it always works out exactly as intended every time. Oh, and well, you know, I go to the DMV every couple of days just to, just to bring up my spirits, you know, so just to enjoy how efficient and fast it is. Yes. Yes. Right. It's a wonderful experience. Lovely, uh, lo- lovely, quick service. They have lollipops at the counter and everybody looks very attractive. Right. Anyway. So, so you flat. died on stage. Yes. Very. So, and the story isn't even half over yet. It's the horrible thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so right as I jump in, I'm, I, I, I still, I, I'm like, okay, I got the right chart at least. And I still haven't figured out where in the form we are. And I'm scanning this chart, this new chart that I'm learning towards the end of the song. And right as I feel like, okay, I think I know where we are, song ends. And I just kind of play the, play the oh, this man. tinkly you, chord at the dude, end. Did you the nailed that one. last chord, though. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I so like, I'll, I'll ask again, uh, what was the value of that pressure in that situation for you? What did you learn from that? Okay, well, there's, there's another story that kind of ties into what I'm trying to say with this. Oh, okay. There's, there's two instances in the same event, the same concert. Okay, uh, okay. I'll, uh, I will ask him in a minute what, yeah. how he no, learned. No, we'll get back to that pressure. for sure. Carry on. So I went – so I felt horrible coming off of that tune. I, it was abysmal, and – I just was like ready to die on the stage right at that moment. I was just like, strike me down, Lord. Just take me home. You start hitting your head on the piano. Almost. That would have drawn more attention to myself, which I didn't want. I wanted to melt. I wanted to disappear. I'm sorry. Have you seen the video of the drummer? He did. It it was a drummer in an orchestra. He did a solo. Mm -hmm. It was a a young Asian boy. Did a solo. The solo was mediocre. But he, but he was passionate and he was doing his best, but you could tell he was nervous. He finishes the solo, and a couple seconds later, fall, you know, kind of falls back into the pocket, and everything had kind of dropped down low at that point. You, the, the shot is on him. He throws up. <laughs> he vomits oh, no. <laughs> in front of everybody. Oh, no. And I, it, you could tell he was. You could tell how he was feeling by how he looked. Like this was the worst day of his entire life. <laughs> and what's weird to me is that he experienced this after. Like I, I can totally understand experiencing the uncomfortability beforehand and having to deal with that, and then going on stage and and once you get into it, you're normally good. You know, you figure right. it out. Even though it's it's uncomfortable, maybe you miss something. Whatever, you're in the moment. This idea that you do that and you're and you're so affected by what just happened that you vomit on the floor is I don't understand it. But oh, I get it. I get it completely. The yeah. Oh, okay. The poor kid. The poor kid vomits and then goes. I gotta finish. So he comes back in and starts playing the beat again. <laughs> oh my god, that's awesome. <laughs> It was one of the most uncomfortable videos I've ever seen in my life. I would absolutely encourage you to not go watch it. No, I, I, your description is apt enough, I think. <laughs> it was very, very uncomfortable. I, what's crazy, though, is it doesn't – you know how the, they'll normally uh, clickbait it? Mm-hmm. I, don't, I, I don't think it said anything about the vomit in the description. I think I was looking up bad drum solos, 
And so the 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 drum solo happens. I'm going, oh man, that's that not that the, bad. That was the story, and I was like, yeah, you know, he could have done better, but you know, it happens. He'll be fine. All of a sudden, <laughs> and that was it was the most. It was it was so surprising. <laughs> anyway, okay, carry on your story. No, of, no, of so, overcoming death. Yes. Yeah. So we, he calls another tune, and this is a tune that we did rehearse, and I'm like. Perfect. Okay, I got this one, right? And I'm st- I'm starting to feel back in the groove again because I'm I'm like playing chords again that I know that I know that I I know, mm. right? I'm not worried about am I on the wrong chart? And we're playing this tune. He calls on Pete, Mark, our guitarist, to take a solo. Then he takes a solo, and then on the very last note of his solo, and I'm enamored. By the way, I'm I'm just watching him and just totally in awe. Because this guy is just incredible on so many levels. First of all, the technical ability on the trombone. He can play every note crystal clear. And you know the trombone has the slide. Sure. It's a slide. So you're, you don't have like frets or valves or pads that make distinct individual notes. It, but it he's making those notes are, yeah. crystal, crystal clear, which is remarkable on its own. And then he's doing what's called multiphonics, which is where he's singing – through the trombone while playing the trombone, so it has two notes being played through the trombone at once. What? Yes. That's and he did that dance. multiple times. And when the first time I heard him do that, I was like, <laughs> What is this? What person? is going Am I in space? Yes. Yeah, yeah, literally. I'm sitting there enamored with Ron Solo, uh, multiphonics and all. And I'm just sitting there playing keys, and he turns to me, and with the last note, he goes, bonk, right in my face. You know what that means? He wants me to take a solo. Okay, okay. So they communicate with the instruments in jazz. <laughs> well, I mean, when someone looks at you when they're done with their solo, that means it's your turn. Ah. And so he just made it really obvious to the audience so that I could not shrug it off. He, wa- he wanted to push you to the next level, man. Yes. Did you have a next level? Bonk. So, (laughs) I take this solo, and it's the worst freaking solo of my entire life, okay? First of all, I'm self-taught. And I learned piano on an upright. And one of the things you have to know about piano is uh, different pianos have different what is called action. And action is just um, how hard it is, how heavy the keys are to play. Mm-hmm. The so difference an upright, between a MIDI controller with plastic keys and maybe right, like a grand piano. A concert grand piano. Right. So an upright piano um, will typically have very light action. The keys are really easy to depress. Um, it takes no effort at all to play it. By contrast, a concert grand has very heavy keys because concert grands typically are geared for a lot of dynamic range. Right. I want to be able to play really soft. And I also want to be able to play really loud. And so you're actually I moving have, mechanical pieces in the piano by right. pressing down on the keys as well. And so the heavier the key is, the more control I have over my dynamic range. Well, I learned on an upright. And so my fingers are used to really light action and not used to really heavy action of a concert grand. And so my fingers are really stiff. And were you on were of, you on that sort of you, you had heavy yeah, action we, on that a, one? It was a concert grand. I see. The keys are heavy in tandem with the fact that I'm nervous as all get out. Because I've never played this song before, except in rehearsal with the band. I don't have my, my solo chops in order. I haven't broken I haven't analyzed the song at all, really. And I'm trying to impress not only this audience that I don't know, but this guest artist who just showed up. Tw- like 10 minutes ago who I have to be on his goods. I don't want to be the guy who messed up his concert. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm freaking out internally. I'm like screaming on the inside and I just tear through this solo and I get through one chorus. I'm like, okay, I'm done. I take a breath. Right. And one chorus is like one repeat. Of this. And right. I'm getting right to the end of this chorus. I'm like, okay, I'm going to be done with this. We'll go back in the melody. I'll just play chords again. It'll be awesome. My fingers are stiff. And awkward, and I'm like, at this point, you peed your pants, right? You know, 
any semblance of dignity has been thrown out the window at this point. <laughs> and right as I'm finished with this first chorus, Ron's like, all right, one more. <laughs> all right. One more. <laughs> so I take an even worse chorus of soloing. <laughs> It's brutal, man. Brutal. I had my butt handed to me on a silver platter. Yeah. Is what happened there. And so the value of that lesson. Hey, of the, of that Austin, experience, what's the value of that experience? Yes. So the value I learned there was to keep playing at all huh. times. And you, you'll, if you go to music school, you'll hear this repeated over and over again. Loud and proud, wrong and strong, right? doesn't matter if you're playing the wrong notes. If you're strong about it and you're confident in it, you'll be good to go. Even if you're playing the wrong notes, people will be less likely to second guess you if you're confident about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but to persevere through that experience, um, first, uh, when, I, when we were done, uh, Ron told me, he was like, man, you, did, you, did, you didn't suck, is what he said. He said, you, <laughs> did really, you played well. That's you, I, I can imagine that meant so much to you at that point. It did point. mean – well, coming from him, for what I learned of him over the next day, that's a huge compliment. But he said, I played well. And he said, lesser, lesser pianists would have let, let it got away, get away from them. They would have stopped playing. They, mm. would, have, they would have quit. And they, they would have, like, not – they lost control. And you didn't. You continued to play. And that, that was really good. You did well. I was like, yeah, yeah. So if you do battle with the with the chaos, you may, you will grow. You will probably feel very rewarded at the end. You may experience failure, highly likely, but you also may experience some success. And perhaps, in the end of all of that, you will do something good, and you might impact somebody. And that's meaningful. So I'm curious, what is your uh, what is your dealings with approach anxiety, and how have you learned to wrestle with that and become better at uh, at accomplishing your goals when that feels like it's crushing you? I would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much for watching and/or listening. Hope you have a lovely day. Goodbye.